Well, hello, I'm Janet Marana, the executive director of Priest for Life. And you know, normally I start with my Just Ask Janet show and my little music, but we're in a little bit different time. And joining me today is a very, very dear friend of mine and Father Frank Pavones. And no surprise to so many of you, her name is Abby Johnson. And you all know who Abby is from the movie On Plans, that she worked for Planned Parenthood and of course became pro-life. And now she leads her own ministry of helping those uh, come out of the abortion industry and, and get placed out in the world and get jobs. And, uh, and then there were none. And, and that is our goal, that there would be no one who wants to ever, ever, ever work for Planned Parenthood or any abortion mill again. So joining me right now is our dear friend, Abby Johnson. Abby, thank you for joining me today. Of course. Thank you for having me on. Uh, truly, this is, um, I woke up this morning and, and I just thought if there was ever any interview I would want to be doing this morning, it's this one today. So thank you. Well, thank you. Well, just in case there's someone who <clears throat> just crawled out from under a rock or came down from Mars, who never saw it unplanned or read the book, which by the way, I've done it all, <laughs> um, which are fabulous. Yeah. Um, uh, I just want to take people back so they can understand when you were in college, how did you first say, oh, I need to get involved with this Planned Parenthood? Just give it, because this will help, I think, parents who have kids going off to college understands how they can be influenced. You know, like you didn't start off saying, Oh, I want to be with Planned Parenthood, but things happen. So give us a little snapshot about that. Yeah. So, you know, it was, I, you know, I, I did not grow up in a, a pro-choice home. I did not grow up in a, in a home that, um, you know, my parents believed in abortion or anything like that. I grew up in a conservative home in a Christian home. But we were not a family, you know, this is, you know, the early 80s, right? When I was growing up, I was, I was born in 1980. So, um, I, you know, I grew up in church, you know, every Sunday, every Wednesday night, you know, all of that youth group. But, you know, the church did not talk about abortion. Um, anything that was involved, you know, anything involving sexuality was taboo. You just did not talk about it. My parents were like, well, we, you know, we taught Abby abstinence. And so um, she's certainly going to follow that until she gets married. Um, she's going to do what we told her to do. And so, you know, because she's going to do that, then abortion's never going to be on the table. And so we just don't need to talk about something that, you know, unpleasant with our little girl. And so we didn't talk about it. Um, I went to college and I got involved with a, a man that was eight years older than me. And um, I, I got pregnant and I did not know what to do. And I just thought, you know, I cannot go to my parents. You know, my dad was a deacon in the church. My mom, you know, she was the church pianist. And um, I just thought, oh my gosh, they would be so embarrassed. There would be just so much shame for them if you know if their daughter their their good little you know church going daughter um came home pregnant they would be so embarrassed and and my boyfriend said you know oh no problem i you know i've taken other girls to have an abortion and i'll take you to have an abortion and you know what janet i i just i didn't i didn't know anything about no what, what was even at stake here? I, you know, I didn't, I just, I, I know that sounds dumb, but I just, I had never seen an ultrasound before in my life. Um, I did not grow up with siblings. I, I had never, I, I just didn't even know like what's going on in my womb. Um, I don't know how far along I was, um, in the pregnancy, I did not know what a pregnancy center was. I'd never heard of a pregnancy center before in my life. Um, and so I, I went to the, I went to the abortion, uh, facility and they of course didn't tell me anything. They didn't tell me how far along I was. They didn't tell me anything about my baby. I just paid them money and they said, Oh, it's 
no big deal. It's nothing. We'll take care of it. And, you know, the biggest problem you've ever faced in your life is going to be gone. And I just, I just, I know it sounds so naive and so ridiculous, but I, I just thought, okay, this is great. And, you know, I can, I can still, you know, I can go back to my life and my parents will never know that I had sex. They'll never know that, you know, I, I disappointed them in this way and I can just pretend like everything's fine. And so that's essentially what I did. And I would like to tell you that I, I felt this regret and remorse immediately, but I didn't because I really didn't know that there was anything to regret or feel bad about. I felt relief when I, when I see all of those studies that say, you know, Oh, 95% of women feel relief. Yeah. That was, that was me immediately. i I felt relief. Um, now of course those studies never show women, you know, 10, 15 years down the road. Right. right. Um, they always stop. If you look at those studies, they always stop within the first five years. Right. Um, and so I, I didn't even realize what I had done. <laughs> And so then fast forward a year later, I'm on my college campus. I not thinking about my abortion. Never. I'm never thinking about my abortion. Um, I meet a woman at, at Planned Parenthood with Planned Parenthood. She's on campus and she's trying to recruit people to volunteer with Planned Parenthood. She starts talking about all the amazing things that Planned Parenthood does. I did not have my first abortion at Planned Parenthood. And so, um, and she's talking about all the health care they provide and how, you know, most of the time they're seeing low income women. And, and I'm like, that's great. You know, who doesn't want to help low income women? Who doesn't want to help women receive health care? I mean, everybody, right? And so, um, and then she did ask about abortion. How, how I felt about abortion. And I said, well, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up pro-life and she said, well, that's great. She said, you know, she wasn't hostile or anything like that. She said, you know, that's great. She said, pro-lifers are good people. She said, but you know, they just, they don't understand the big picture. They don't see that, you know, without abortion, without safe and legal abortion, women are going to be forced to have unsafe abortions right. uh -huh. and they're going to take matters in their own hands, Abby. And, you know, our goal at Planned Parenthood is to make abortion rare. You know, we're trying to prevent abortion and, you know, she starts going into all these things and I, you know, as this young 20 year old kid, um, I'm thinking, well, this all sounds reasonable. Right. So you, you jumped in and volunteered for them, right? Yeah. I thought, well, this sounds good. I mean, this right. sounds reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, so that I, you know, I would have considered myself pro-choice even when I went to go volunteer for them. I didn't have a, an opinion really either way, even as a person who had an abortion, because I had, I had put that in inside and didn't even think about it. And so I, you know, I was just like, a, I had no opinion about it either way. When I went to go volunteer that first time, I just thought I'm here to help women not die from illegal abortion. I mean, that's right. really what I was thinking. I didn't right. think about it either way. I didn't think about the baby. They never brought up the baby. They never brought up what was going on inside the womb. It was always about the woman. And that is how it was, Janet. That I mean, for a long time. It yeah. Was always so, about the woman. So you volunteered and then didn't you get pregnant again? I did. Yeah. I got the same guy. Um, I, I, well, I ended up marrying him. Um, bad decision. Um, and, but I, I think there was something there, right. Where I didn't realize it, but I, I mean, I had gotten pregnant by him. There, there was a connection. 
uh, with him, even though it may have been a little subconscious or something, but, you know, um, we had had that connection and we got married and, um, it was not a good marriage. And, um, and so we ended up uh, getting divorced and 14 months later. And after he left, I found that I was pregnant. Wow. And I thought well, now you went to Planned Parenthood, right? Well, I was already there. Right. I, mean, I, was, I was there all the time. Right. So at this point, I, you know, I talked to some people there and they said, oh, well, Addy, I mean, you just, you have an abortion. That's what you do. You don't right. want to be stuck with this guy, you know? Right. And this time I thought, well, I'm going to do the, the medication abortion because right. that is more natural. It's going to be easier for me. And so I did the medication abortion and nothing could have been that that could not have been further. And we know, even if anyone watched the unplanned movie, uh, they really <clears throat> depicted how horrible the chemical abortion is. You, <clears throat> you get severe cramping. Some women have described it worse than childbirth. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> of course, you know, you bled and you expelled your baby into your bathroom mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's horrific. And I, I have testimonies of women from Silent No More. They talk about seeing little fingers and toes and how mm -hmm. horrific it was. So after that medical chemical abortion, what, how did you transition into actually working, instead of volunteering now, working for Planned Parenthood and actually becoming director of that clinic? Yeah, so um, I ended up, I mean, it's crazy as it is, I ended up going back to Planned Parenthood, even after that bad experience, even after, you know, they had essentially lied to me about how the, the, you know, medication abortion was going to be. I went back and then I, I kind of said, okay, I, I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to tell women not to do this abortion that I just did. And I, I'm going to convince all of these women to do a surgical abortion. <laughs> I'm so I thought I'm going to be the hero here and convince him to kill their baby in a different way. Um, so I, I end up graduating from college. They offered me a job, was a, you know, good money. Um, it was comfortable for me. And um, I said, okay, so I take the job. Within a year getting that job, I get promoted to a uh, community services director, which meant I was going to be in charge of like fundraising, community outreach, um, political affairs, things like that. So I start doing that. And then um, within a year of doing that, I got another promotion to actually running the entire health center, health center um, that I was, I was working at. And that meant I was head of, you know, the abortion program, the, family planning program, the whole facility. And, um, and, and, you know, that was really when, I mean, I can say that that was really when I, I, my mind really, um, became overcome with evil. Um, I don't really know any other way to say it. I really went from being a person who, was, you know, kind of ignorant about it right. to being a person who was actively pro-abortion. Right. Um, and of course, Abby, we know from your testimony in the past, working with Planned Parenthood, <clears throat> they were into selling abortions. They were giving you quotas to like how many to sell, perform, perform monthly goals, quarterly goals, and all that. So in the midst of all this pressure from them of sell more abortion, sell more abortion, your abortion clinic was being uh, protested by and for the 40 Days for Life people, David B. Wright, yeah. Sean Carney, uh, mm -hmm. were coming on a regular basis, praying That's outside the clinic. Huh? Yeah, 40 Days for Life started. Yeah, yeah. In, front of, in front of my facility, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You won the prize. <laughs> they started with you. <laughs> and I think on one of these occasions, there was a Catholic priest who was standing out there with the group praying and leading prayers. Tell us the story about 
first of all, how did you even know who this priest was? And then your reaction that you were, I think you wanted to go out and, and meet him. So tell us about that whole story. Yeah. So <clears throat> when I worked at the clinic, I, I started watching, um, you know, part of, part of what I did, I, I you know, I, I kind of kept up on, I, you know, I subscribed to some different, you know, pro-life emails and um, just kind of was always looking at what was going on in the pro-life movement and, and things like that it was kind of a, became kind of a student of the pro-life movement. And one of the things I did was I watched a show um, on EWTN and, um, and it, and so I, and I think, Janet, was it called Defending Life? Yes, it was. Defending yeah. Life with Father Frank Pavone. Yeah. And so, um, so I, I watched Defending Life and it was weekly, right? Yes. Weekly. <laughs> yeah. So I, I watched it every week and you were on it. Yes. Yeah. So I would watch it with you two. And, um, and there was a mailbag part of the show, right. Where you guys would yes. answer, answer questions. And, um, and so you know, I just was intrigued, right? Because I, I like to hear like your answers to different questions that people had. And then there was always, you know, just you guys talking and Father Frank would be talking about things. And so anyway, I mean, I watched it faithfully, you know, every week. And so anyway, one day uh, we had, you know, we had cameras everywhere, all around the building and um, CCTV everywhere. And so I was standing in the office, I was standing in our office and <clears throat> that's where all the, that's where the monitor was for all the cameras. And I, I look up on the monitor and I see um, a group of people walking over to our clinic in, in front of the building. And I'm like, and I noticed that it's a, it's a priest, right? Cause I see the collar and I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I, th I think I know who that is. And so I said, Rosie, that was our person at the front desk. I said, zoom in on that priest. And so she did. And I said, oh my gosh, y'all. I said, that's Father Frank Pavone. <laughs> and, um, and so Rosie was actually, uh, she was Catholic. And um, she said, how do you know who... Father Frank Pavone is. And I said, well, I watch a show every week. And um, she's kind of started laughing. And I said, guys, I said, I, I kind of want to go meet him. I said, do you think I could go out and meet him? And <laughs> they were like, no, you cannot. Go <laughs> no, you cannot go out and meet him. And so I just stood there and, you know, just kind of watched. I went back to my office and um, my office had windows so I could, I could watch, you know, what they were doing. And I just kept thinking, I went back and forth for like 30 minutes. Like, do I think, do I think it's okay if I go out and meet, I mean, should I go tell him I watch a show? And um, anyway, and, and so it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that much longer actually that I, I mean, I think maybe a couple years later, it was, it was when I actually ended up leaving. Um, the abortion the industry. Right? Yeah. And of course, I remember, Father Frank and I remember uh, when you came out and before you went public, because David B. Wright and Sean Carney told us about it, and they were asking our advice, and we said, listen, you have to be very kind to Abby, you have to get her healing, you have to, you know, just nurture her, uh, you know, don't put her, push her out too soon, you know, <laughs> protect her. Uh, and then, so tell me, what was your then first, after coming out of the abortion industry, what was your first connection with father? And tell us a little bit about your relationship with father Pavone. Yeah. So, um, I think it was David B. Right. That, um, connected us very, right. very quickly. Um, after I had left, I mean, I connected with father before my story broke publicly. 
Um, and I, I had never had intentions of my story going public ever. Um, but it was, it was Planned Parenthood who put my story out publicly. Right. Um, and so I had never, I never had any intention of that. And so I only had three weeks of quiet. Um, and so I, I think it was around that second week that, um, father Frank had, had contacted me and, um, we had a, a, a good conversation, <laughs> um, now that I could actually talk, you know, talk to him, um, and, you know, I, I told him, well, I've, you know, I've been a fan for years. <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, we, we had a good conversation and, and, and it was really, I mean, it was beautiful because at, you know, at that time I felt very, you know, alone. Um, all of my, you know, friends, um, in, you know, in the, in, the clinic where I had worked, they had, you know, they were instructed not to have anything to do with me. And so I lost all of them. Um, my, I was Episcopal at the time. And so, um, my faith community that was very pro-choice, they wanted nothing to do with me. Um, and then I had all of these new people in my life who were pro-life. And I just didn't know if I could trust them. Um, they had been the people that I had been instructed were my enemy for the past eight years. Right. And, you know, now here they are trying to befriend me. And I just felt like, really? I mean, we're going to be friends now. I've been yelling at you for the past eight years. And now <laughs> we're just going to. Now that I bow, right. So, me, just like that, it was, you know, yeah. it, was weird. it was a weird transition. And so um, I know, I know Father Frank was very instrumental in helping you and some other ladies to go on a re centurion retreat and help, you know, you, you deal with the fact that you had been involved in the abortion. In addition to your two abortions, you had been then responsible for the death of all these children, but by selling abortion. Tell us about that retreat experience and father's way of bringing that healing to you and how you felt about all that. Yeah. So when we first started and then there were none, we knew that we wanted, you know, part of what we, what we had to do was we had to have healing retreats. I mean, that was part of what we had to do. And so, um, I knew that father had, had facilitated these sorts of retreats before, you know, primarily with former abortion um, doctors. And so um, I had asked him to, you know, help me try to, to create this with, um, with the workers that were coming out to us at, and then there were none. And so he did. So we had a retreat, um, he came with us uh, to two um, different retreats, one in Alabama and one here in Texas. And um, it was really great because I didn't, you know, I wasn't really sure what, what to do. I was still very much healing myself. Uh, I mean, I still am. Um, and so, you know, he came and um, really gave us a good, a good framework. But for me, that was a, a really great moment for me because I, I didn't have a group of people to really heal with, um, until we started and then there were none. And so for him to be able to come and to really show me how to heal with them was, was really a beautiful experience and to show us how to heal together. Right. Was really beautiful. Because that was something that a lot of us had never done before. And some of the people on the retreat had been out of the industry for years, but had been walking this path by themselves and had right. felt so much shame and embarrassment. And so now we didn't have to feel that way anymore right. because we had this group of people that we could heal with. And, and he really facilitated that and, and showed us how to do it. 
Right. And then, of course, <clears throat> how did you then make your journey into the Catholic Church? Where, where was Father's role in helping with that? Yeah. So um, I, you know, I started going to Mass. All my new friends were, <laughs> were Catholic. Um, and so they, you know, started inviting us to Mass. And we were like, mm, we were pretty resistant. But um, at first, and anyway, we ended up going and then feeling like, oh, maybe this is where we belong. And um, once we said that, we were, I don't know, kind of instantly in RCIA. And uh, funny how that happened. So um, that was Sean Carney's doing. So we ended up getting an RCA. And the more we learned, the more we realized this is truth and this is where we need to be. So, um, you know, I talked with father about it and, and he was so, you know, kind and gentle and not pushy about it and just said, well, you know, keep reading and, you know, keep learning. And so, um, and so we, uh, we went through that whole process and, um, he was actually, I, I wanted him to be the one who was, um, who was there to, um, cause he had been so instrumental in our journey in the church and all of it. Um, I wanted him to be the one to actually be there to give us first communion and to confirm us into the church. Um, but then he was not able to, he was not given permission to do that. Um, and what, what year was that Abby? So we were supposed to come into the church, uh, December of, uh, 2011. Right. And, um, but we were delayed, um, because he was not able to, to do it. And so then right. we, we couldn't come into the church until. And, and I want to re involved. remind everyone that it was in September of 2011 that Bishop Zurich, the, his bishop from Amarillo, banished him on, with no reason to come to Amarillo, put him in a uh, retreat convent setting with some nuns and put him out there for months and months and it was Bishop Zurich who would not give Father permission to come and bring you into the Catholic Church. Okay, so we have to put the blame where it belongs. The same bishop that's responsible for what's happening for, to Father today, all the way back in 2011, stopped him uh, from bringing you into the Catholic Church. So you were delayed then a few months more. So when did you actually make your journey into the Catholic Church? So it was Easter of um, 20, 2012. And right. Still, I wanted um, Father to be there, even if he wouldn't, even if he couldn't be the one to actually administer um, First Communion confirmation. Um, but he still wasn't allowed um, to even to even come and be there. Right. Again, the bishop wouldn't mm -hmm. let him do it. And so um, I know a little more time went. And what didn't he become the Godfather remotely or something for one of your children? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So. Um, then uh, Alex was born um, a, a few months later. Uh, I was pregnant when we came into the church. Um, it's kind of funny because we had we had to have our marriage convalidated um, in the church. Right. And it's kind of funny because, you know, the priest, one of the things he asked is, you know, are you open to life? And I was like huge pregnant. Um, we were like, yes, we are. Um, so, uh, so Alex was born on uh, July 9th of 2012. And we had asked uh, father to be his, his godfather. And he of course accepted and, um, but again, uh, could not be there. Um, because of Bishop Zurich, we have to keep saying that because of the Bishop, he wouldn't let him go. Right. Right. And so he couldn't be there. So we, we had to have a proxy. Um, there, but he is um, Alex's godfather and, you know, keeps up with him. So, That's and true. Alex has, I mean, he's so blessed to have father um, as his godfather. So That's right. So now we know, <clears throat> you know, this sudden, you know, by the way, Father Frank, as of this taping of the show, he still didn't get official communication from the Vatican about being laicized. Um, and I guess that's going to be coming, but Catholic news agency leaked 
this whole thing. And, uh, and that would have been on um, December the 17th. They leaked the story. Uh, I don't know who gave them the fish, but they had the official document from the Congregation of Clergy and the Nuncio that Father Pavone still has, as of the taping of this program, hasn't received. Um, and so for us, the whole thing is pretty shocking. And, um, and so, Abby, when you think about when they remove a priest from ministry, like, and, and kind of throw them out of the, the priesthood or try to, um, if you look at canon law and you look at the offenses that happen, it's like, you know, pedophile, uh, grand larceny of stealing church funds. It's really major stuff. And did you know, I, uh, Abby, on the very day that they, they did this to Father Frank, do you know the Pope put a priest back? He took him from being laicized back into ministry, and that priest was found guilty of raping nine nuns. I mean, what, what do you have to say about it? I mean, is this not absurd to your mind? I mean, you've had this personal relationship with Father Pavone for over a decade, and you know him. So can you just tell us how do you feel about all this? Um, <clears throat> it is, um, I think it is a, it is a great scandal in the church when, when the church would remove, um, such a, a holy priest who has been fighting for for the for the for the unborn and their mothers for so long and yet <clears throat> we see the church letting so many i mean truly heretical priests stay in ministry and not only stay in ministry but be promoted and some of the priests that are closest to Pope Francis are some of the greatest heretics in the church. Right. And that is where the church is at this time. Right. And I think that, you know, this is, I mean, th this is, this is just where we are. Right. Church, we have got to be, you know, the, the faithful have got to be praying. I, you know, we made a decision, um, you know, a, a long time ago as, as a family that we would be intentionally praying by name for these priests who are standing up and speaking, speaking out. Um, who are willing to give up everything for the right things. And that's what people have, we've got to start doing that. We have to start speaking up ourselves. And, you know, I, there's a, a lot of people within the church hierarchy that may not be fans of Abby Johnson um, because I'm willing to, um, to speak out and, uh, and to, you know, rock the boat in, in the hierarchy of the Catholic church. And that's okay. Because at the end of my life, I'm not going to be standing in front of the USCCB at the end of my life. I'm not going to be standing in front of any Bishop at the end of my life. I'm going to be standing in front of my creator, Jesus Christ. Right. And he's going to be asking me, you know, what did you do to stand up for the church? What did you do to stand up for the least of these? What did you do to stand up for the persecuted? What did you do? And the persecuted is not the USCCB. The persecuted is not the Pope. The persecuted is, is, is not all of these people that are persecuting others. And I have to be able to, in my conscience, 
say that I stood up for the right things. And none of us are perfect. None of us always make the right decisions. I don't always make the right decisions, but we are trying and we are, we are all trying to do the right things. And we are all trying to, to stand up for, for the church and for church teaching. And as long as I have known father Frank for 13, over 13 years, he has always stood fast to church teaching. He has always uh, spoken up for the unborn, for their mothers, uh, for those of us who have, who have left and have needed healing. Um, he is a defender of everything that is right and good. And for people to say, for the, for the church, to actually say that he shouldn't be political, my gosh, if the church shouldn't be political, then who should be? Right. The Bible actually says that we are to be involved in politics. And he is following what scripture says. We are to be involved in politics. We are to be involved in this, this political game. We are to do that. And because we haven't been, that's why we have someone like Biden sitting in office. Right. The church has been too silent. And so I am thankful for, for brave priests like Father Frank who are willing to, to be vocal and to say what needs to be said about these clowns in office who are literally tanking our country. We need right. more people like him to be raising their voice and to be speaking out. I am devastated by what has happened to Father Frank. And the night that this was that this was that this was leaked really by by CNA. Um, you know, I talked to him that evening and you know, I got off the phone with him and I just I I wept. Not just for him but for the state of this church that I belong to, that so many of us belong to <clears throat> and what is happening right now. Well, I'd, <clears throat> I'll tell you, you know, I've known father since he was ordained. So I know him for 34 years <laughs> and I can tell you in those 34 years, he always tapes every sermon and homily he's given. Okay. He's got a whole collection on our website. Uh, every talk he gives, he's recorded everything. And I challenge the Pope himself and any bishop, go listen to the library on our Priest for Life website. And I dare you to find anything there against church's teaching. You will not find it. He has stood by the magisterial teachings of the church and not like these heretics that are out there preaching falsehood. And, you know, <clears throat> the bishops want to attack and take away his priesthood, but yet they let Nancy Pelosi and Biden go up and receive communion when they, they put in on, they sign themselves into law laws that want to kill babies till birth. And I agree with the Abby, it's despicable. But one thing, when I spoke to father, like you, the night, the whole thing happened, he reminded me, cause it's not the first time he's been attacked. You know, it's been go ongoing. And he, he said to me, Janet, we can't let the evil one get in. So the way to protect that is stay close to Jesus, go to mass, receive the sacraments. Yes. That's the grace we need so that the devil doesn't get into our thoughts and our minds because that's what, and so very often, sometimes when things happen, people go, that's it. I'm not going to go to the church. Yes. Um, no, you can't do that. No. You've got to stay close to the Lord. You got to pray fervently, but don't give up going to mass, go to mass, Receive the sacraments because that's what will give us the spiritual strength, I think, Abby, to, yeah. to deal with this, right? Yeah, that's right. And in fact, when I went to Mass yesterday, I mean, the entire, and I sent him, you know, I, I sent him a text yesterday after Mass, when I left Mass, I said, I, I offered my entire Mass for you yesterday. I prayed the entire Mass for you. You know, I went up and received the Eucharist and I, I just prayed for him the entire time. Right. Um, 
We've got to stay close to the sacraments. That is, that's our shield as Catholic. That's right. that's you know, it. stay in the sacraments, stay, stay in confession. I got to tell you, I got to go to confession. Um, I, you know, I'm actually going tonight, Abby. I'm going tonight. <laughs> I got to go. I got to go after all this. I got to be honest. Me too. I have to do. Um, but you know, we've got to stay in, we've got to stay in the sacraments. We've got to stay close to Christ. We know father is during all of this. Um, he, <laughs> he sets a great example for me because, you know, I, I have a tendency to just, you know, get really angry and, um, no. and, and he's like, Abby, no, like, no, you know, we're going to keep doing our work. We're going to do what we're doing, bring an end no. to abortion in, in his lifetime. That's father's goal. And that's what we're going to keep doing. So, and you know, my favorite, my favorite, favorite quote from father Frank, and I put it on my Facebook yesterday. I put it on my social media yesterday is when you defend the unborn, you will be treated like them. And that's always been my favorite quote from him. And, you know, we have to remember that. That's right. Um, and and, well, and that, that's really it, Abby, because they abort the unborn and they're trying to abort father and all those who stand up for father and for the unborn. That's what it is. It really is. Right. It's all about abortion. And we know that. And, and just for the record, <clears throat> for the, the little one blasphemous little post that he put on social media, Father himself, Saturday night, did a whole video explanation. And he said, I realized, oh, I caught myself. I shouldn't have done that. It was deleted. And he said he went to confession for that little slip. We all are sinners. We all slip. But where's reconciliation? And, mm -hmm. and again, to, to, say that, to say that that's one of the reasons you're taking away his priesthood, when there's these other priests who have committed heinous acts. Are you kidding me? Still... There are bishops in Germany. Yeah. They are allowing yeah. homosexuals to marry. Yeah, I know. Are you kidding me? Like yeah. that's what they're using against him. And there right. are bishops literally allowing gay people to marry in the church. And right. they're still, they're still bishops. They're still priests. Right. Oh, here's another one for you, Abby. <clears throat> Cardinal Tobin of the Archdiocese of Newark. Every June, he has a pride mass in the cathedral that he celebrates and flies the gay flag outside the cathedral. So you're right, Abby. There's the corruption right now in our church, but we've got to stand strong. Okay. And I just want to tell you, thank you for you, your ministry, all the people, and then there were none who I know are behind Father 100%. Please keep praying for him, and uh, we're not going to give up. And I will call Father Frank, Father Frank Pavone, till the day I die with my dying breath. I am not changing one bit. <laughs> no, neither. He will always be father to me, no matter what. Me too. No matter what. Well, thank he, you. Has been, he has been. He has been That's a right. father to me. And so they can they can say whatever they want, but he will always be Father Frank to me. Okay. Well, thank you, Abby. God bless you. And I, I love you. And so does father for helping us.